Welcome on Angle fans, it's your boy GS Luke here with our course breakdown for this week's Rocket Mortgage Classic. Got to talk all things Detroit Golf Club and make sure we're all on the same page to get our research started to make some GPP lineups for PGA DFS. Also go out there, select some of those outrights and overall get our process started for this week. So hopefully everyone is ready to dive on in and we'll start with some of our course details. The goal with this preview is to keep it a little bit more concise. So just going to run through this stuff real quickly. So with our course details, we've got ourselves a par 72. It's a Donald Ross design just like we had at Pinehurst number two, but not nearly as difficult. The rough here is not a huge factor. It also plays a lot softer than what we had at Pinehurst. And while all the slopes and contours around that track were extremely you know, drastic, you had a lot of carnage that resulted from that, this course is a lot more toned down. So it's more so made for your everyday golfer to go out there and enjoy it and not necessarily to go out there and be a major championship type of tech. So in terms of some of the agronomy, green size, all of that, average green size is just over 5,000 square foot per green, which is on the smaller end of the spectrum compared to PGA Tour courses. I wouldn't call them tiny. They're not tiny like a Pebble Beach, some of the other tracks where they're closer to 3,000 or 4,000 square foot, but still well below the 6,000 average that we have for the PGA Tour. Bunkers aren't all that penal. There are plenty of them on property, but I will say that they are among the easiest to get up and down of on all the PGA Tour. There's only one hole with water in place, so not that much um, water hazards out there to go ahead and trip up players. Your agronomy would be a bent slush poa mix for a majority of your surfaces. They will be more so bent grass than poa, though, so keep that in mind when looking at some of your putting stats and whatnot. And then your rough is a bluegrass mix. So they've got mostly that Kentucky bluegrass. A few other strains of grass mixed in as well. And the one thing to note is that it's going to be four inches this year, which in the past it had been closer to three, maybe three and a half inches. So maybe it's a little bit longer this year, a little bit more dense for 2024, but I wouldn't imagine that would be a massive change. In terms of some of the scoring averages around the Rocket Mortgage Classic, with an easier golf course setup, almost everything is going to be easier than your tour average. So whether it's your fairways, greens, scrambling, you name it, everything is just going to be slightly pumped up compared to what we normally have on tour. So to give you some perspective, fairway average is about 7% higher than what we're used to seeing at about a 66.9% fairway rate. Your green regulation percentage is almost 7% higher than what we have week to week. So that is 72.3%. Your scrambling rate is nearly 4% higher than what we have compared to the PGA Tour average. So also, again, easier to get up and down. You have slightly less three putts at this course, more birdies, less bogeys per round. I mean, you name it. Literally every stat is going to be easier. So it's not like this course is super short. It's not like it's like all drivable par fours or you know all the par fives are like 500 yards you'll see when we go hole by hole it's a lot more of a tra traditional like normal type of setup but when it's soft at this course like it normally is when you have next to no undulation on the greens these guys are going to go out there and fill it up so i think you'll get a better taste of what these players are going to face when you actually see it hole by hole so let's go ahead and just do that right now i believe the routing is slightly different than what we're going to have here in the overhead views but more so just want to give you a taste of what the players are going to face and hole number one is actually one of the tree-lined fairways, which is not always going to be the case. So you'll see here in the hole number one, right, 10, 15 yards to the left, you've got a tree line. Same thing on the right side. Um, most of the other holes are a little bit more wide open. So believe it or not, driving-wise, this hole is a little bit more demanding than most, but still only a 400-yard par four. So most people are looking at a birdie look there. Hole two is 455. Also, a little bit of that tree-lined aspect, particularly towards the left side of this fairway, but just a mid-length par four, uh, not much that's going to trip up players. Three is 391. Some of your longer players can get this up within 100 yards of the surface, but just like hole number one, another hole where most people should have a birdie look and uh, a little bit more wide open than you had with holes number one and two. Hole four is your first par five. It is reachable for your longer players, but at 630, it's not a guaranteed you know, two-shotter for everyone in the field. So hit the fairway. You should be getting it up near the surface in two, even if you're not a long player, but still a birdie look for most players. Five is your first par three. It is 169, so not an overly demanding par three, right? Typically, we see them in that 175 to 200 yard range for the PJ Tour. Um, this one is a shade under that when it comes to distance. 
Six is 469, so another bid length par four. I would say the front nine is a lot more demanding than the back nine when it comes to the driving. So if there's a spot to kind of get into trouble, right, maybe you make two, three bogeys on one side, it's on the front. It's where you'd have to potentially have to lay up after, out of some of the tree lines. That's about the only trouble you can get into here. Seven is your next par five. It is more reachable than the first one that we had. And even if you are a shorter player or hit it out of position, you're probably getting this up near the green in two. Eight is a 374 yard par four. Um, your longer players will definitely take a hack at this, particularly if they move up the tee box. But if it plays downwind, even from the tips, you could give it a go off the tee. Nine is 208 yards, so significantly longer than that first par three. But even with some beefier length, it's not all that tricky. I mean, there's not that much protecting this green. There's some rough around the green, which isn't all that difficult. Uh, just uh, like I said, it's not as much a test as what we had at Pinehurst number two. If you're starting on the backside, you've got a 427 yard hole to start it off. And though it does dogleg from right to left, it is a lot more wide open than what you had with holes one, two, and three. 11 is 233, so it is a long par 3, especially compared to the ones on the front side. But once again, there's not that much to trick you up. It's not a tiny green. You know, it's just some real simple up and down shots out of rough. 12 is 483, so a longer hole for sure. But as you can see, these back nine fairways are much larger than the front nine. So though you have a longer hole here with hole number 12, the tee shot gives you a little bit more room for error. 13 is 395, so another shorter par 4. Um, not drivable, but definitely a wedge regardless of what you hit off the tee. 14 is 565. It is a reachable par 5 for pretty much everyone in the field. And though you have some water to the left, a lot of players will just bang it past the green and try and get up and down for a birdie. 15 is 158, so this is a shorter par 3. Um, just like the first par 3 that we had, very scorable. Should be a birdie look for a majority of the field. 16 is 450, so a bin length par four. Also a uh, pretty wide fairway. You can see the, the driving corridors on this back nine are a lot larger. 17 is 575, another par five and should be reachable for pretty much the entire field unless you just hit a horrible drive. And then 18 is 463, pretty solid finishing hole. This uh, little ditch can come into play and can give you some rough lies. Um, every once in a while, there'll be water down there as it is a drainage area. But during the summer months, I don't think it's normally uh, a factor. So it could lead to some nasty lies up there in that ditch. But it's a, a finishing hole that's maybe slightly harder than your average around here. But uh, yeah, at a course like this, nothing's overly difficult. All right, now that we've seen the golf course, let's talk about some of our key stats over here on Bet the Number. And as per usual, guys, make sure to check out Bet the Number if you haven't already. If you want to try out the tools yourself to do your modeling, um, do some research for this week, use code GSLUKE when you're signing up. You will get a free trial membership over there or a discount off any membership as well. So can code GSLUKE to go out there and check it out. But in terms of what they're looking at this week, the number one thing that caught my eye was this par five scoring. And last year when I went out there, I selected Ricky Fowler to win, which was one of the bigger outrights of hit for quite some time. He was one of the best par five scorers heading in. Now that combined with some solid approach form, it's a putting form last year, but the reason why I took him out of birdie fest. If we take a look at the par five scores, there are some small sample size guys showing up, but Sam Stevens has been playing a lot better recently. I mean, even Wesley Bryan has low key been a lot better, and I think most people would realize but when we find the guys that have legit been playing it's the Ben Griffins who with his backslide golf ball has been hitting the ball a lot further Cameron Champ you'd expect to see there a Steven Yeager a player we're probably going to have to keep an eye on this week a Bo Hostler showing up a Davis Riley with his solid form are all players that I think are at a distinct advantage because we went through some of the holes on there the mid-length par fours are pretty average holes the par threes two of them are super easy for sure a majority of how you're going to get to 20 under par is by just destroying the par fives three of them easily reachable in two one of them's a little bit longer right 630 yards your longer players like a sam stevens cam champ etc etc even ben griffin with the harder golf ball are going to be able to reach that in two so i think that that is a something that first off i've been honing in on at this golf course for quite a while and it's great to see that bet the number was right there with me I'm also looking at some of these shorter approaches. A majority of your par fours are going to leave you something from 130 yards and in. And even for your longer players, 
That's a nine iron at most, probably a pitching wedge for most of these tour players. Um, an elite tier power guy, probably a degreed wedge from 130 yards and in. So trying to take a look at guys that excel from that portion of the golf course is another way that you could go about it this week. So we've got Duffner showing up there, Pan Kazire, a player with a, a larger sample size. Gacheski, probably a small sample guy, um, but Alex Smalley, a plus player from closer to the green. Um, Kevin Kisner, surprisingly, showing up there. Um, ben Griffin once again. So that's a second category that Ben Griffin's been a popper in. And if we're just trying to find some crossover here, Kelly Kraft has been a solid par five scorer as well. Henrik Norlander, Ryan McCormick finding success in both categories and also Tom Whitney down there. Bet the number is also looking at 200 plus yard approaches. So this would be for a few of your par threes. Um, the longer par four, right, one that was 480 yards, you're going to have an approach in this bucket. And then also your par five. So I don't think you want to completely ignore it. I would be slightly heavier on the shorter bucket than I would with the longer bucket. And to take a look at those longer shots, you've got Berger hitting those shots well recently. Henrik Norlander showing up in another iron bucket, which shouldn't be a surprise. Guy's been striping his irons all year. Alejandro Toasty, you've got Aaron Rye here. Pan Kazire showing up again. Uh, another guy who showed up in multiple categories. Tom Whitney has showed up in all three categories, so definitely somebody we would uh, want to point out there. Luke Liss, Johnny Vegas, a lot of your longer players that are showing up in this 200 plus yard bucket. Outside of that, I think your normal old shots gained approach is always gonna be helpful, especially in a weaker field event like this. Shots gained off the tee. I mean, you've seen guys like Bryson, Matthew Wolf take apart this golf course. So I think that bombers could be a way to look at it as well. But for me guys, this is a week to look at birdie or better percentage, opportunities gained. Those were stats I would add on top of the stuff we have here and bet the number because we gotta get to something like 20 under par to win. I mean, barring some crazy weather, um, firm and fast conditions or just some crazy wind, th this place is going to get taken apart. You're likely going to see something at least 18 under par win, if not something into the mid 20 under par range. So uh, I want guys that have that kind of firepower. And for me, I, I think the par five scoring is a good way to look at that, but also just how many opportunities you give yourself, right? Opportunities gained is how many birdie looks you're generating from 15 feet and in. Um, if you're just looking at birdie or better percentage, how many you're actually converting on, to me, th those are gonna be some of the other things that I'm incorporating. Alrighty guys, that is all I've got for the course breakdown this week. Trying to keep it a little bit quicker, a little bit more concise, as I know sometimes we get a little bit drawn out with these, but hopefully you feel a little bit more prepared for all of your action this week and are ready to get after it for all of your exposure. First off, go ahead and smash the like button if you haven't already, and also go ahead and comment down below Below, what you've got as the winning score for this golf tournament and if you go ahead and get that score right you'll win a free month of my patreon page my patreon is where i post all my projections and modeling for any given week so whether you're a dfs player looking to get all of the shots gained metrics all my projections and research at your disposal or somebody that's on the prop side of things looking to try and find some value on underdog or prize picks uh, that's the place to go ahead and get it. So if you get that correct winning score, you will win a free month of that Patreon page. And even if you don't want to go out there, win it through the contest, go ahead and check it out for all that behind the scenes content. There's a link in the description of this video to that. And on there, you help support the channel, all the content that I'm posting, and it gives you direct access to all of those spreadsheets. So check it out. There's a link down below, like I said before. Um, smash the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the content to come, which will include a DFS embedding preview later on this evening. And of course, all the prop content throughout the week and all the live streams out there for showdown and props. I'm looking forward to it. Should be an absolutely fantastic week. Best of luck out there with your exposure and I'll see you guys throughout the rest of the week here.